looking in the book of Acts this morning. Acts was written after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as a church, we're walking through the book of Acts as a church, and we, we wouldn't normally, we, we normally would walk through a book of the Bible, but we probably would take a Sunday to focus explicitly on the resurrection of Jesus. But it just so happened that the very next section in the book of Acts for our church focuses on the resurrection of Jesus, and so it was kind of a, a happy convergence anyway. So Acts chapter 2 this morning, we're going to look at a single paragraph. And we need to remember every time we open the Bible that God is addressing us. He's addressing us actively. He's addressing us personally. He's addressing us for transformation and comfort and benefit and hope. This is not merely a, an ancient literary text. This is God himself speaking. So let's begin reading. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 finds... Peter, having been overwhelmed by the presence of God among his friends and fellow disciples, a crowd has gathered and he now begins to preach to them, saying this in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Let's take a moment and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you for this Easter Sunday, and we pray now as we open your word that you would address us personally and profoundly through your word. Lord, I ask for your help. I'm not worthy or sufficient of this passage, but Lord, every time we open your word, your spirit is bringing it to our hearts. And so we delight in that this morning. We pray you would bring it to us profoundly and in power. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in an article in 2013 in the Huffington Post, the writer tells the story of a Texan named Rue Ferguson. Only in Texas do you give men named Rue. One wonders if it was a long labor, perhaps. Rue Ferguson. <laughs> and Rue had a piece of artwork hanging, apparently, behind the door, behind the door of his office. But, as has happened with many people, a particular traveling show came to town called the Antique Roadshow. And he discovered a surprise. The article says this, Normally, we consider the artwork adorning office walls a step above dentist waiting room art. But the painting titled El Abanil, which hung behind the office door of the Texan, is a glaring exception. The unassuming piece brought by Ferguson's great-grandparents in 1920 is actually a masterpiece by Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. The painting, made when Rivera was only 18 years old, is worth between $800,000 and $1 million. But, but, it lived in obscurity in Ferguson's home office for years. According to the Corpus Christi caller, Ferguson's great-grandparents originally purchased the work in Mexico and passed it on to his parents, who thought it was a fake. They then kept the work in storage, unaware of its true value. Priceless living in obscurity. 
priceless but kept in storage, unaware of its true value. It's a great similarity to the Ferguson painting and what Peter is attempting to do as he speaks to this crowd that is gathered around the home of these disciples in Jerusalem. Very great similarity. He's trying to inform them that something that was right in front of them has far more value and meaning than they might realize. Something that was literally in their home, in their own backyard. Events had transpired that the worth was beyond their imagination, beyond what they could fathom. And so he wants to reintroduce them, as it were, to Jesus Christ. He wants to reintroduce them. He's saying, I, I, know, you, I know you know about him, but you don't really know what you know. Like Ferguson's painting, Jesus was, as it were, obscured to the people of Jerusalem. He was a man of obscurity. And many of them surely thought this radical teacher had passed out of history on a cross outside Jerusalem, had been buried, and that was the end of that. It's also true that many people today suffer the same delusion that sadly Ferguson did, and these people outside of Peter's and the disciples' house in Jerusalem did. We know about Jesus. We've heard that story. We've heard that name. We have some sense of the facts, even, of the Christian witness about Jesus. But for our hearts, for our emotions, for our faith, it is like a painting hung near but obscured. It's close, it's known, but it's not known. It's not felt. And every time we open God's Word, and in particular on Resurrection Sunday, we, we, we need to, to remember again, this is not just some truth hung behind a door close by, but not felt. No, this has incredible value. It must be displayed. And so we want to hear what Peter exhorts the men of Israel to hear and reintroduce ourselves whether we're believers in Jesus or we're just here because it's good to go to church on Sunday, we want to reintroduce ourselves to the true value of Jesus Christ. I want to make three points about Peter's speech this morning. Three points about Jesus. How do we reintroduce ourselves to Jesus? How do we hear, like Peter exhorts us to hear, hear these words about, and the topic you notice there in verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth. Who was this relatively obscure? And even the reference to Nazareth emphasizes that obscurity. It was a lowly respected town. Jesus of Nazareth. Who was this man? Well, first point about him regards his identity, his identity, his death, and his victory. The three points this morning. His identity. Jesus of Nazareth, in verse 22, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that, listen, God did through him in your midst. Now listen to this. As you yourselves know. Jesus, uh, Peter rather, uh, uh, what he's doing as it were is he's, he's pulling back this door and he's inviting them to stare at the truth. He said, now you've seen this, you know this, but let me encourage you to take another look. Let me encourage you to examine this again. You know this, Jesus of Nazareth, I know, he's obscure. He's from an obscure city, despised even. Nothing visibly impressive about him until he began his ministry, and then look what began to happen. He was a man attested, we might think affirmed, credentialed, proven to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. The point Peter's making is the evidence of the divine in Jesus' life was irrefutable. Jesus had raised people from the dead. He had healed people with a word, even a touch of his garment resulted in miraculous healing. He had preached to thousands. He had fed thousands with a few loaves and fish. And Peter's just reminding them of this. He's saying, look, this apparently obscure man was obviously the vessel 
of God's activity on earth. In Jesus, God was revealing himself, Peter sang. God was at work in Jesus. God was obviously, transparently, what other explanation could there be that Lazarus is here walking around except that Jesus raised him from the dead? You've seen the people that were oppressed by demonic activity out of their minds even now. Citizens, peace-loving and regular members of the community. You've seen those sick people that he's healed. You've heard reports of what he's able to do. What other explanation is there except that this apparently obscure man actually has a much more profound identity? That in Jesus, God was at work. That in Jesus, God was on the move. That when you look at Jesus, you're seeing God's activity on earth. And we know from the teaching of the scriptures, the reason God was at work in him was that Jesus was the son of God. God, the son, the eternal son incarnated, taking on flesh and revealing God's activity on earth. Peter's basically setting this crowd up. He's saying, you know this to be true. Remember when I was a kid, we used to watch, and I, I loved them. There were these old versions of Sherlock Holmes. I thought they were fantastic. So we watched them, and my brothers and I, and one thing that Sherlock Holmes would always tell his well-meaning but less informed partner, Watson, was you see, but you do not observe. And then when Watson was confronted with what he thought was an intractable problem, Holmes would say this, you will not apply my precepts, he said, shaking his head. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Holmes couldn't understand why Watson can't get that. And Peter is making the same point. I know it's improbable that God would choose to reveal himself in a person from Nazareth. I know it's improbable that God would choose to reveal himself in a man that was ultimately crucified. I know it's improbable that a person could so represent God as to reveal that he is God. I know it's improbable. But what other explanation do you have except that God was indeed revealing himself in Jesus? I encourage you this morning, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, let's let's re-examine this glory. God revealed himself in a man named Jesus from Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was God the Son, God the eternal God, the all-powerful God, the God outside of natural limits, the God who cannot be seen because he's spirit, who cannot experience pain because he is invulnerable to any weakness. That God made himself into a man without ceasing to be God and revealed his deity and his purpose moment by moment over three years of ministry. God came to earth. And was at work in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's reconsider his identity. Christian, who is it that, that you believe in? You believe in the God made man, Jesus Christ. You believe in a real God who became a real man. And his name is Jesus. That's who you believe in. We're not some religion that just affirms creeds or confesses truth of some ancient heritage that has no real, actual, personal value. No, we believe in a a real person, a real God who actually revealed himself as a real man and humbled himself and took on the nature of a servant. That's who Jesus is. Let's re-examine the value of this identity. His identity, second feature we want to remember, his death. His death. You notice down there in verse uh, 23, Peter moves on from his setup, reminding them that God himself was at work to bring back in the surprising, ironic result of Jesus' work, which was that he was in conflict with the leaders, people were opposed to him, and surprisingly, he was handed over to the Romans and crucified on a Roman cross. 
Now, Peter lets them know that this death actually was not a surprise to God and not a surprise to Jesus. He says this in verse 23, this Jesus delivered up, listen, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So the first thing he says about his death was it was God's plan. Imagine the shock of that for a God-fearing Jewish person who knows from their Old Testament that to be crucified and hung on a tree was to be under God's curse. Imagine the shock of that. Here's Peter standing up and declaring to this people who know their Old Testament, most likely they're there in Jerusalem because they're described as God-fearers. They're there for the feast. And he says, the man that was crucified was crucified because of God's plan. It was a definite plan, it says. God knew about it ahead of time. And that's not just advanced knowledge. That's knowing with the purpose of causing it to happen. God knew about it. Why did Jesus die? Because God planned for him to die. And Jesus intended to die. And Jesus went willingly. We can only imagine Peter remembering the many times that Jesus said in advance, the son of man will be betrayed. He will be crucified. And after three days rise, I go to Jerusalem, Jesus said. So that the death of Jesus was God's plan. And we know because the scriptures tell us that this plan was not merely for Jesus to be an example of innocent suffering. It was not merely for Jesus to show what it means to endure valiantly to the end. If you've read about ancient people who, who sought to face their death with dignity and honor, that, that, that was not the point of Jesus' death. This plan wasn't just a, an example of fearlessness in the face of death like some Roman soldier throwing his life away for the sake of the emperor. No, Jesus was doing this because the plan was for him to be the Messiah. Peter makes this abundantly clear as his sermon continues, and we'll look at that next week as a church. The Messiah had to die because the Messiah's purpose was to offer salvation to sinners. And only by dying could a Savior offer salvation to sinners who must face death for their sin. And so it was God's plan that Jesus would die. It was the will of the Lord, Isaiah 53 says, to cause him to suffer, to crush him. Jesus prayed in the garden, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Peter interprets from that, well, it was the will of the Lord, the definite plan of God for Jesus to suffer. Let's let that sink in. Let's unveil that glory again. Take it out from behind the door where it lives in our hearts many times, and we know it's there, and we're aware of its truth, but we need to examine it so we can be affected by its value again. This really is a priceless masterpiece. God the Son became man. Why? To die for men and women who must face death for their sin. There is no way to heaven if Jesus doesn't die for your sin. There is no way to know God if Jesus doesn't die for my sin. There is no way to escape the curse of God's punishment if Jesus doesn't absorb it in himself. That's the plan. That's the value. But it's not just God's plan. It's also in a mystery that the Bible holds in tension throughout its pages. It is also man and women's responsibility. It says this. This Jesus, no, notice the, the tension here that he just holds. Peter holds these two truths without bothering to explain how it can both be true. Jesus was delivered up in verse 23 according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But notice this. He switches without a problem, without an apology. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Oh, what a moment. Try to imagine that moment. Try to imagine that moment. Try to imagine Peter, he's proclaimed, just proclaimed the mystery of all mysteries, that God the Son could be under God's curse on the cross. And then he turns and looks them in the eye and say, you crucified him by the hands of lawless men. 
Because he wants them to be aware, if you want to benefit from what Jesus did by dying on the cross, if you want to be able to celebrate what we're celebrating, that he rose from the dead, you have to first recognize that you crucified him. And this was literally true, likely, of many of the people there in the crowd. Literally true. They literally had handed him over to the Romans. They literally had succumbed to the pressure of the religious leaders. They literally had handed Jesus over to be crucified. But it is also spiritually true of every person who has ever had a godless thought in their life. It's also true of me. Why did Jesus have to die? Because I am a sinner. And we have to feel Peter's gaze, and more importantly, God's gaze, making eye contact with us. We will not love Resurrection Sunday unless we realize that Peter is talking to you and me. The reality of sin is that it is the attempt to kill God. Literally took place outside Jerusalem at Calvary. But it's spiritually, the attempt is still made every time I have a godless thought, every time I'm selfish, every time I try to serve myself rather than my spouse or myself rather than my children, every time I, I look where I should not or think what I should not or crave what I should not. What I'm really saying is I prefer to be in charge and I wish you were out of the way. And so it's not any different from Peter saying to them, you crucified him. But the good news is, if we can see the cross as something done by us, then we can celebrate resurrection as something that took place for us. Here's what John Stott, the author, says. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, before, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. The old writer Octavius Winslow expands. He says this, if you have fled to Jesus as a poor, empty, believing sinner, there is not a throb if, notice the if there, if, if you have fled to Jesus as a poor, empty, believing sinner, then, then there is not a throb of love in his loving heart, not a drop of blood in his flowing veins, nor a particle of grace in his mediatorial fullness, nor a thought of peace in his divine mind, which is not yours, all yours, inalienably yours, as much yours, listen, as if you were its sole possessor. And in proportion as you thus deal with Christ individually, travailing to him, living upon him, living out of him, and dealing as personally with him as he deals personally with you, well, then he will involve himself in your concerns and will become growingly precious to your soul. Isn't that what we want? Don't you want that, Christian? Don't you want that? Don't you want Jesus to become growingly precious? I love Winslow uses that, that phrase, word precious, that Christ would be precious to your soul. Precious, not just known, not just near, not just affirmed in a technical category, but, but precious to your soul. And Christian, don't you want him to be precious to your soul? Not just affirmed, but precious, dear, affectionate, grateful, loved, adored, precious to your soul. And he says, well, well, how that takes place is by going to Jesus personally, recognizing that Jesus personally died for your sins by personally remembering we crucified him. It was my sin that kept him on that tree. Else he would not have had to be there at all. But it was my sin. And being my sin, and being that he died for that sin, it means that sin has been paid for in full. 
as surely as Jesus died, if it was for my sin, and I believe that it was as humbling and as breaking as that is to admit, then I can say, then I can claim, well, Jesus surely died for it. And when he rose, I rose with him. And in his resurrection now, I can say he is precious to my soul, having removed the barrier between me and God, having made it possible where I can know God as my father and as my savior without any barrier of my record of sin between us. Christians, remember. Look at that masterpiece again. That would once cut you off from God. Cut off God the Son from his Father so that you could be reunited to him. Reintroduce yourself to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian, the great news is you're not dead yet. Because you're not dead yet and you're sitting in a church room full of people that love Jesus, well, there's good news because you can respond to this message as well. And you don't have to be cut off from God. And you don't try to have to have a better week next week to make up for your bad week last week. You don't have to try to manage your life. So many sins and so many good deeds and hope that it measures out okay in the end. No, you don't have to do that. You can come directly to the one who died for sinners and you can by faith place your sin on his account and you can receive from him the forgiveness that he purchased when he died and that he affirmed when he rose from the dead. So do that. Do that this morning. What a day to turn to Jesus. Easter Sunday, when we celebrate his resurrection. And you can turn to him by faith. You don't have to see him physically. You know that he's real. I remember hearing a person uh, talking to, to somebody, a coworker that wanted to debate Christianity with them. And apparently this, this friend was just tired. It had been a long day. And I guess he'd had many arguments at some point. And he just didn't have the, the stomach for another argument about the existence of God and everything. And so this, this friend was just talking to him and said, you know, he wants to argue again. And the Christian brother just said, you know there's a God and you know you're going to meet him one day. And the man said, you're right. <laughs> I'd like to say that to you this morning. If you've grown up in this church and you're not quite sure what you think about God yet, not sure if you want to make it your own, or if you're here as a guest, maybe a family member or something, can I just say that to you? You know there's a God, and you know you're going to face him one day. I, I can say that on the authority of God's word, because God's word says that every single person knows that they were made. They don't really believe that this world is an accident. And all of our thoughts of goodness and beauty just come from some imagination in our own heart. Now, they don't believe that. You know there's a God, and you know you're going to meet him one day. And the good news is you can meet him covered by the death and life of Jesus Christ instead of on your own sin. And if you believe in him, you can do that right now. So you can walk out of this room unafraid of death, unafraid of anything, because on your worst day, you will see your Savior when you die. Let's reintroduce ourselves to what maybe is familiar, but is actually priceless. The person and work of Jesus Christ. Finally, his victory. His victory. I, I love Peter's bluntness. This sentence just breaks in. Given Peter's personality, I can almost imagine this just punctuated words coming out of his mouth. Verse 24, God raised him up. God raised him. It's like Peter can't wait to burst forth the secret. You killed him by the hands of lawless men, and you feel the, the crowd and their head goes down in shame. And we know that because later on it says they were cut to the heart. But then, I, I wasn't there. I don't know. But I imagine Peter with a big smile on his face, and he just looks out and says, God raised him up. God raised him up. God raised him up, he says, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So guess what? This isn't the end of the story. Your sin, even the sin of those who crucified Jesus, isn't the end of the story. No, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. The word there, it, it brings to mind in the original, the pangs of labor. 
It's like Peter's using this imagery uh, in the same way that you, you can't actually stop the pangs of labor. Well, well in the same way that the pangs of death could not finally stop Jesus from ushering in this new area in which he's, he's raised from the dead and brings new life to all those who believe in him. He loosed the pangs of death. He brought it to an end because, and I'm going to look closely at this phrase, it was not possible for him to be held by it. I want to make a point about the victory of Jesus in rising from the dead. Now, now many Christian songs, and I, I'm grateful for these songs, and we talk about this in the church, they, they emphasize Jesus' victory over death, and they use language as if Jesus is sort of a wrestler, and he out-wrestled death. And that's not bad. I mean, in one sense, that's true. That Jesus was stronger than death. That unlike weak people who can't out-wrestle death, Jesus could out-wrestle death. But the truth is, is a little more profound than that. There's another side of that. What does it mean that Jesus was stronger than death? Because if Jesus was just individually stronger than death, where's the hope for us? Because frankly, I'm not. And you're not either. You're not individually stronger than death. You can't stop yourself from dying. I, one of my brothers who will remain nameless, there's only two of them, uh, but one of my brothers was convinced when he was young that he could, he could will himself. <laughs> oh, man, he's really a humble man now. He could will himself to not get sick. And he, he used to have this confidence. You get sick, well, you just, you just will yourself to not get sick. <laughs> I thought, man, you are an idiot. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that because we weren't allowed to say that kind of language, young people. <laughs> and you can't will yourself to stop dying. You can't will yourself. And even if it's true that Jesus was stronger than death, there's, there's something more profound and more assuring for you and me when he rose from the dead. Peter goes on to explain that Jesus' resurrection was, was not merely a resurrection from death individually. It was a revelation that Jesus was God's Messiah, that God had always intended for his Messiah not to face the curse of death. And we know from the rest of the Bible that Jesus' work before death and during death was the basis upon which he could be raised after death as the Messiah to offer life to all those who believe in him. What Jesus did in dying as a Messiah was inextricably linked to what God did in raising him from the dead. God rose him not just because he loved Jesus as his son, but because he was bringing to life the Messiah who could offer life to everyone who believed in him. And that's what we see in the rest of the scriptures, that Jesus' resurrection was not just like Lazarus's and the other people that Jesus raised from the dead. It was more profound than that. One of my favorite quotes about this point is by John Piper. A little bit lengthy, but it's worth it. He says this, The keys of death were hung on the inside of Christ's tomb. From the outside, listen, Christ could do many wonderful works, including raising a 12-year-old girl and two men from the dead, only to die again. If any were to be raised from the dead, never to die again, well, Christ, Christ would have to die for them, enter the tomb, take the keys, and unlock the door of death from the inside. The resurrection of Jesus is God's gift and proof that his death was completely successful in blotting out the sins of his people and removing the wrath of God. You can see this in the word, therefore. Christ was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Philippians 2, 8, and 9. From the cross, the Son of God cried, It is finished. And by means of the resurrection, God the Father cries, It was finished indeed. The great work of paying for our sin and providing our righteousness and satisfying God's justice was finished in the death of Jesus. Then in the grave, he had the right and the power to take the keys of death and open the door for all who come to him by faith. If sin is paid for and righteousness is provided and justice is satisfied, well, nothing can keep Christ or his people in the grave. In other words, death depends 
on curse. Death depends on curse. True death, eternal death, permanent death, it depends on curse. But since Jesus bore our sins and our curse in his body on the tree, and since God declared that sacrifice to be sufficient and raised him up, well, then there is nothing in death that has the ability to hold people in its grip any longer. Those who believe in Christ believe in one who not only lifted himself out of the grave, but made it a guarantee that everyone who is united to him cannot stay in the grave either. Death is contingent on curse. Christ completed the curse of God so that all there is for you and me, if we're believers in Jesus, is life. Life that we have in him. This is the Christ who really exists. This is the real, actual value of the person that we know. This value must not be allowed to remain hidden, familiar, but not cherished. Whether you've been a Christian through 50 Easter's, or you're just coming in here because it's, it's, it's good to be at church on Easter Sunday, let God's Word reintroduce you to Jesus Christ. If you're feeling guilty about your sin and you're a Christian, remember, the resurrection reveals that guilt was paid for in full. If you're afraid of death as a Christian, remember, Christ's life reveals that death has no power over those united to him. If you're suffering because you've had a hard week at work or a difficult week in your family or relational challenges are dragging you into a moment of despair, you just can't understand why you keep trying to grow in godliness and it's still hard. Remember, on your worst day, eternity rapidly approaches. And there is a person waiting to see you if you've believed in him. As to his identity, he is the God-man, the incarnation of God himself, revealing God on the earth. As to his death, it was God's purpose and Jesus' willing intention to die on the cross for sinners. And as to his victory, it was revealed when on the third day, a group of dear friends came to his tomb and discovered it empty, that God had exalted his chosen Messiah out of death, showing that in his death, the curse had been broken and rolled back and life was available to all those who believe in him. I read that 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 Texan, Rue, said later that this, this painting needs to be displayed for everybody to see it. How much more is it the case that our Savior, Jesus Christ, he needs to be displayed in our hearts. He needs to be celebrated and sung about and loved and cherished as precious to our soul. Take out the masterpiece and look at it again. Enjoy it again. Feature it prominently in your heart again. Let's do that right now. I'd like to invite the band to come forward and take their places. We're going to take a moment. I'll pray, and then I just want to sing that, that final song of exaltation of Jesus again, and then we'll, we'll close. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to adore you. We want to worship you and sing to you. And Lord, personally, we, we seize this moment to re-engage and reintroduce ourselves to your glory. Lord, wherever our hearts have been numbed by time and familiarity, Lord, would you, would you break in by your Spirit and glorify the good news of who you are and what you did and the joy the joy of this morning celebration that you are alive having conquered death and the curse in our place receive our worship right now we pray in jesus name amen